Avi, we have 2,000 people watching this live stream and you just blew up. That was crazy. There's no way we have 2,000 people watching this. Thing. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, I can see that. Why do so eyeballs. many people pay? There's literally no reason. Wait, are we are we live right now? Or are we just... Oh, I thought I didn't... I didn't yeah, we're live. We were live. We're live. Okay. Like, I, I, I was... Okay. I, I oh, think no, no. Just... Yeah, this, 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 this podcast is great. Everyone should watch. I, I'm, I'm kind of shocked <laughs> that... And we're live. Welcome back to another SNX podcast. <laughs> we're here. Yeah, there are a fuck ton of podcasts with people who don't trade and are never like, yeah, guys, look, if the market's trading, market's trading. I, I'm so, sorry, I had, to, I had to short the entire market. So, so just so everybody knows what's been going on, this is our first time live streaming on YouTube. This is going to be a report, recorded podcast, but it's being presented as a stream where you can join in and chat and we can all talk about crypto together. And then we can put um, different comments up on screen to just sort of like discuss what people are talking about, if there's something kind of relevant to go over. But it feels like it's been a pretty massive week of news and accumulation of kind of like coiled springs in the market. Haven't really broken out yet, but a lot to talk about, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, the last the last five days, there's just been a lot of fall in the market, up to up to sixty five k, all the way back down to sixty one five, and now nobody has any idea what's going on. Jonah, I don't know if you saw, but I tweeted out a poll that said, "Hey, is Bitcoin going to be up, down, or sideways in September?" I voted up. I voted up. Up and down were within margin of error. I mean, nobody, nobody has any idea what's going on which to me is pretty bullish not gonna lie i i'm i'm as bullish as ever i mean we're locked in this range we can't seem to break out of it in either direction but i think the next move is up not down i'm, I'm really convinced of that so every time it starts to trade back down towards the bottom of the range everybody freaks out hey are we going lower are we going to lose all our money is this the final time when bitcoin goes to zero and the charade ends and we all have to go back to our day jobs and my take for what little it's worth is no, we're just ranging like we have during every other non-2022, non-2020 summer um, because people are off uh, not paying attention. They're off on vacation. And when people get back in the saddle in September, which does tend to be a pretty bearish month for Bitcoin, unfortunately. But I think, I think as we go into the fall, we're going to get some serious bids here for a variety of reasons. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've talked about this for a while that September is probably going to be bullish for BTC. And I, I stand by that. I mean, if you look when we were trading, when we were trading below 60, we were both sitting here. I literally had a bull as my background. I'm like, guys, this market is is going up. I mean, just to just to recap, at least in my opinion, what happened and why we sold off so hard. You just had a lot of you had a lot of selling because of technical reasons as the yen carry trade unwound nasdaq came off bitcoin came off and that caused the sell off down to 50. what wasn't true was that there was overwhelming weakness in the market it was just a technical move and so now that we've sort of rebounded that entire entire move went back up went back up to 65. i think it's possible that we can trade between 61 and 65 maybe 60 and 65 for the next two weeks or so, but at some point, I think that the allocation that we're expecting comes into the market and then you're probably looking at 70 and you're looking at 70 with no supply overhang, which to me sets up for a very, very, very bullish Q4. What, quick question for you on that. Why has the supply overhang gone away? Like, are you talking about the US Marshalls selling Silk Road coins or? Yeah, it's not that the overall supply overhang has gone away because I still think that there's going to be some government sales that are going to need to occur. It's that you've had a lot of the weekend sell out and you've had the average price that people own a Bitcoin go up a substantial amount. And so the people, you know, just to just to take a step back, something that I've, I've always used for trading this type of market is what are what are people's price targets? Like what do people think that Bitcoin can go to? Basically, the people that bought in the 30s and 40s, and when the average price of buying Bitcoin was 30s, 40s, people's price targets were like 70 to 80. 
And now that, that, that average price has gone up because a lot of people have taken profit. A lot of people have gone out. A lot of people panicked out and bought back in. Price targets are starting to go higher. They're starting to go 100, 150. And so they're just le less likely, you know, every day that goes by, people are less likely to sell 70K than they, than they were before. Hmm. As long as the average price goes up. Right. Well, what do you and use the to track the average have... price? How do you track UTXOs? Is there like a metric on um, one of those glass glass node sites that you look at a lot? To yeah, uh, you can use you can use on chain metrics to track it. Glass nodes Glass nodes pretty good for checking when when the last you know the average price of the last Bitcoin moved, um, but also just more more generally like, move, like yearly, weekly moving averages still going up. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> I completely wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, one thing we should talk about, because I, you know, I've got a sideways background behind me, like my process for dealing with these types of markets is to do nothing, like not to not to stop paying attention. I'm super dialed in, but I'm remaining disciplined and I'm not trying to overtrade. Um, part of it is because I don't want to realize a bunch of gains for tax purposes and then churn around and maybe miss a rally. But more importantly, like, I just think we're range bound. I don't think I have the ability to predict when we're going to break out. I feel confident in the direction that's going to, the direction of travel when we do break out. So I'm just trying to remain disciplined and do nothing. It's not the most exciting strategy. It's not very sexy, but it, you know, frankly, it works. Um, <clears throat> I, there, there is plenty of money to be made as an active trader, like buying dips and then lightening up on pops. You're very good at that, Avi, but, um, I'm a little bit less active. So I think my strategy works as well in a, in a slightly different way. Yeah. That, isn't it crazy though, that you pay taxes to have people arrested for memes? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, can, should we talk about Telegram and the Pavel Durov arrest? Speaking of, uh, speaking of whatever the heck that was. Yeah, that was, that was honestly insane. I mean, I, I, did, I did was, you have, did I you have a bunch a... of like normie relatives reaching out to you like, Avi, why do you use Telegram so much? Are you a criminal? Yeah, basically, my my dad my dad texted me. My mom hit me up. My sister and a few a, a few of my friends were like, "What? Do you, do you see this news? It's crazy. This Telegram, you know, the the guy the guy got arrested for crazy stuff." I mean, what's insane to me is that he decided to go to France. I mean, come on, what are you doing? <laughs> but at the same at the same time, it was it's kind of ridiculous to arrest the CEO of a social media platform that has no, I mean, it's not like he was doing it himself. Yes. The obviously every platform, including Facebook has illegal things that happen on that platform. Yeah. It's crazy that they arrested. Him. And it must've been that know, he didn't cooperate with whatever they were investigating. Whereas the, the telling thing is Facebook and all the other platforms must be cooperating. Uh, so it goes to show who's forking over your data and who's not. I mean, to me, it's just funny that I mean, he, he knew that if he was in France for an extended period of time, it's probably going to be an arrest and it wasn't even an extended period of time. He's there for about half a second. Yeah. He just got like swiped off the, the tarmac at, at whatever private airport he landed at North of Paris. Emmanuel Macron, the president of France tweeted his take on it just a few minutes ago. Should I read it with a, with it a wasn't French a few accent? minutes ago. I think, I think it was, I think it was a little bit ago. Oh, you're right. It was a couple of, but hours let ago. me, how's your French accent? You, you speak okay. French, right? Yeah. I'm married to a French lady. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. So he said, um, I've seen the false information regarding France following the arrest of Pavel Durov. France is deeply committed to the freedom of expression and communication to innovation and to the spirit of entrepreneurship. Isn't it amazing that the president of France can't speak English? Like everyone's uh, supposed to speak English. Yeah, but entrepreneurship is a French word. You entrepreneurship, have to it will remain Entre so. It shall in remain so. This, this like getting arrested for building software thing is, is picking up steam and it's kind of freaky. I mean, like it's like one step removed from getting arrested for saying something on software, which I'm not like an anarchist or anything. I don't know whether like being in the crypto community has turned me into this paranoid schizophrenic or not, but like, I'm, it's kind of unsettling to me. I love Telegram. I use Telegram. What I told my mom today is that I use Telegram because it's the best user experience. You can use the same Telegram account on multiple phones with different phone numbers, which other 
platforms won't let you do like iMessage. And it's like, it's fun. And half my community's on here. Like what, what the heck is wrong with Telegram? The craziest part about it is that it's not even safe, right? It, it's, it doesn't have encryption by default. So if the feds wanted to, it, it's not, it's not as hard to crack as it is WhatsApp. I mean, look, the issue at the end of the day for us and for crypto and generally is that Telegram is associated with scammers, right? Tel Telegram is associated with bad people, with, with bad things. And then it taints the reputation of crypto, obviously, because crypto and Telegram are, are intertwined in a big way. And going back to what you were saying earlier, if you can get arrested for posting a meme on X, then at what point can you get arrested for just using Telegram, right? If there's a government out there that brands Telegram as this haven of criminals, oh, if you use this platform, then we're going to call you a criminal. If you tweet this thing, then you are a criminal. I mean, that to me underpins the need for a decentralized social network that, yes. you know, if, if the centralized version of it gets shut down, then at least all of the data and the way that you interact with people can be ported over to a new front end. And that, that's really, that's really the beauty of all the decentralized platforms, right? Is whatever front end you have, whether you use a telegram app or, or, or another app, if the back end is all on crypto and it's decentralized, then at least if telegram gets shut down, then you still have your data, right? That's actually something that I worry about on Twitter is if my Twitter gets shut down, how do you rebuild the idea of having the same followers, having the same DMs, having the same contacts? It just, boom, just goes away. Yeah. And so this, again, is the future, in my personal opinion, of the Telegram blockchain, which is why I'm personally still very bullish on Telegram. I'm not. I think this is super bearish Telegram's coin because their visionary founder is now distracted but I think it's bullish long term, the idea that decentralized social should be a thing where like you have skins for the decentralized chat apps that look as beautiful and work as beautifully as Telegram does. You have end to end encryption that's like uses the same open source RSA, whatever it is, library that Signal uses. All of the data is stored on your device, not in the cloud um, All of your unencrypted data is stored on your device. And the back end for that is on chain. Like now I kind of, I see the rationale for it because this is ridiculous, right? Like I, it's a chat app. Of course, people do nefarious things on chat apps. They probably do them on WhatsApp and iMessage uh, as well. I, I, I don't frankly understand what it is about Telegram that's so special. Um, so on that note, everybody join our Telegram channel. Avi started one. Um, Hop in there. We talk markets. It's fun. You can find it in Twitter somewhere. I, I even post pictures of my dog. <laughs> it's a very, very cute dog. Now, I, I just want to go back to that point real quick. I think that this, there are 30, I think there are 30 people that work at Telegram, the actual Telegram app, but the Telegram foundation is separate. The, the Ton blockchain is separate from the Telegram app. They have a relationship, obviously, and they were started and it was ideated by similar people, but then it split off. I think what this does is it lights a fire under the ass of the Ton Foundation and the people building on Ton to produce something really incredible. That's a really nuanced. That's an amazing take. So you're saying this is like one of those misunderstood dips to buy. Like I have the mid curb take like, oh, it sucks. Pavel's gone. Sell it. You're saying no, 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 no. Like wh while all the Jonas are selling, buy it. I see what you're saying. You know, not the, not the Jonas because <clears throat> the Jonas, the Jonas wouldn't buy back. But you, Jonah. You, you okay. would buy back. Well, let me pull so. up my little trading view here. Hold on a second. What's this? What's our little smellogram coin doing right now? Look, I, I'm, I'm of the mindset that him getting arrested is actually, it's a, it's a Barbara, it's a, what is it? Barbara Streisand effect where now everyone realizes the value in the fact that Telegram had built out a blockchain. It's like they were, they knew that something like this would happen. Yeah. Oh, wow. The price action is really interesting in this. So Obviously, the news gets announced. It was trading seven. It immediately gets nuked down to five dollars a token. And then today, you've got like Avi Fellman, just or somebody like you, just sneakily bidding it on this thesis, and it's kind of rebounded. That, that's really interesting. It, it does feel like it's bottomed out. Um, I mean, my take. Okay, look again. 
none of this is financial advice. It never will be. In fact, if you listen to the words that come out of my mouth, you will lose money and you'll go bankrupt and you'll probably end up on the streets. Yes. So let's just get same, that out Same goes for me. If you listen to anything that I say ever. With that being said, I think that it's important to remember that there are are a lot of people that hold Telegram in a pretty deeply concentrated way. And what we don't know is how they're going to react to this. I think in the long term, this is very good for Telegram. And it, again, lights a fire under the ass to go build a good product. But at the same time, if it goes up back up to $6.50, I think that that's probably a sale because I think a lot of people are going to be you know, selling out, selling out of their positions slowly because they're very concentrated, candidly. Now, what that that probably gives you an opportunity, and in the long run, in a year from now, that's going to lead to, in my opinion, a much better distribution. So, I think in, if any, if anything, in a year from now, Telegram is going to be higher than it is than it is today. But you know, you have to be ready for the fall of this thing. Yeah, and you also have to benchmark yourself against Bitcoin, ETH, Solana, and the other things that could also be substantially higher a year from now. You don't want to like be up 10% on Telegram, patting yourself on the back and have missed a 100% rally in ETH or Solana. So, you know, honestly, what's interesting, I listened to um, I listened to Pavel's interview with Tucker Carlson. I'm not a usual listener to the Tucker Carlson show, but I did want to hear Pavel talk for an hour about his product. And this was like the most recent podcast about it. So I checked it out. Um, Tucker being annoying aside, uh, what I took away from that podcast is that this is P Pavel's second rug pull, right? Like Vladimir Putin pulled the rug out from underneath this guy uh, with V-Contact, the Facebook of Russia. He basically told him like, become an oligarch and publish whatever I tell you to or sell your stake and get the fuck out. And he, he chose option B. And so this is the second time he's having like his baby taken away from him. I wouldn't to your point, Avi, I wouldn't be surprised if he's just like, all right, I literally can't trust anybody in this world anymore. I'm going to put it all on chain and make it this like permanent, like chat thing that exists in perpetuity and can't be shut down because it's decentralized. Like I, and if anybody's good at building chat apps, it's this guy. This is literally five years ahead of iMessage, Facebook Messenger, or WhatsApp. It's crazy how good this app is. So I could totally see him doing that. And that that would probably be bullish the Telegram crypto ecosystem. Yeah, and and it and it should be, obviously. I mean, what one one of the things that I think is really important to remember is why we're here in the first place, right? We're here to build censorship resistant applications so that no matter what the governments try to do to you, no matter how they try to mess with you, you can escape that. That's the key. That's why we love Bitcoin. That's why we love decentralization. That's that's why we're here, right? And yeah. At least in the at least in the beginning. I mean, now 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 we're now we're here to trade five minute charts and make money. But at least in the beginning, in the beginning, it was very pure. The intentions were pure. <laughs> speaking <laughs> speaking of uh, sp speaking of trading trading five minute charts, one of the worst five minute charts I've seen in a while is the ETH chart. Oh, Do you man. remember? when I told you that ETH was going to be the XRP of the cycle? I'm going to pretend I don't remember because I'm long a lot of ETH. And... <laughs> I, I, said, I said it like two months ago. I think ETH BTC was trading 0 0.055 at the time. I was like, ETH is going to be the XRP of this cycle. I got so much hate for that. And the reality is I think that's actually what's happening right now. I think that's, a, that, that's, a, that's wrong. That's wrong. A lot of interesting applications are quietly getting built on ETH. Um, like what? Even 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 Vitalik says, "Hey man, DeFi sucks." Build well, something I mean, new. Poly, if you if if something gets built on an L two that rolls up to ETH, is that does that count? Or you're just saying no? Like nothing that's going on in base poly market. That's all garbage. Let's just ignore it and pretend it's not happening. Is that kind of what you're saying? One thing you named one you named one real thing poly market. Great. Poly market's great. It's on Polygon. It's probably going to move at some point in the future. And it can be built anywhere. Yeah. Some memes happened and, on base too, by the way. Like there was a there was a thriving moment there. But memes? Brother. Memes? There hasn't I put it this way. Not not many applications have been built anywhere this cycle. The two are like poly market and memes, right? Wait. <laughs> Do you smell that? 
Do you smell Where are you the going coke? with this? You smell the coke? Because <laughs> I can I can smell the coke. <laughs> okay. We're, we are we are we are deranged. For the, I mean, I, I think I just saw someone. I'm also holding ETH. We are deranged. Yeah, I mean, look, the issue with ETH is that again, it's slow. It's, it's more difficult to use than Solana. Even the founder of Vitalik is like, hey, what's going on? You guys are only trying to build out like weird DeFi stuff. Like we should build some real should, things. Should we, should we read that? Like, okay, so just for context, for anyone who isn't paying attention, Vitalik tweeted something that pissed off or got under the skin of a lot of people. He basically came out attacking DeFi on ETH. He said that it's, uh, he called it an, Urabris or an it, it my, it's the it's a snake that eats its tail. In my in my California accent, I'd call it Uro Bros, bro, like surfer style. Anyway, um, basically, what it's it's he's saying that it's just like like purposeless. Um, let's call it a uh, money chase for the sake of money. Uh, like it's it's <sighs> some sort of reflexive cyclical um, money washing machine. Uh, to, to paraphrase, and that there needs to be something a little bit more purposeful built on ETH other than just like lending money to people who want to uh, trade with it in order for the ecosystem to grow and flourish. And the reason why I disagree with that is because having worked in traditional finance for the better part of two decades, um, my humble, you know, respectful question would be, Vitalik, what do you think goes on in, in the normal world of TradFi, traditional finance? It's exactly the same thing. It's just a it's a pipeline of money that's sort of circular, and people derive value from it. And the, to me, the the sort of like most important basic primitive of DeFi is yield. And basically, most of the world can't get a J.P. Morgan Chase uh, high yield savings account. So if you live in an, one of the the world's 150 emerging economies with a relatively uninvestable currency and you decide to store your money on chain in stable coins and you want to earn a percentage yield on it, you want to earn your 5% in line with T-bills, you can do that on chain and you would be foolish not to in many cases. So like, I don't understand why that's not valuable. It is valuable, but it's not an argument for ETH because you can do the same thing on Solana more easily in my personal opinion. Yeah, but that wasn't his point. He wasn't saying, I, I just hope this goes to Solana because I want more pure things on ETH. He was just calling the entire activity worthless, which I think is what pissed people off, uh, myself included. Uh, yeah, I think so. The, the, the issue the issue with Vitalik's statement, now that I, 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 I more understand what you're saying now, yeah, he wrote it off. But I think he wrote it off for a very good reason. And the reason that he wrote it off is because He's still, I mean, I think Vitalik is candidly still stuck in the 2021-2020 era of DeFi, where yeah. you had this explosion of a bunch of different Ponzi schemes, the yield generating games. It doesn't really happen today in this in the same way. I mean, people still try to do it. I see a lot of projects try to raise for it. I see a lot of projects try to lean into that. But the reality is that they're just not getting that much money because I think people have figured out that that's not that's not the game. Right. And so it's just it, it, actually, if what Vitalik said was true, I would like ETH more because at least there'd be a ton of activity, right? There'd be a ton of people chasing yield. There'd be a ton of people using these Ponzi esque uh, programs and activity on ETH would be up and gas would be up. But the reality is that nobody wants that anymore because they realize that it's all that's all short lived. I mean, the one thing that people people say yield, which is funny to me because it's not like crypto develops new yield out of nowhere it just opens up access to a market that already exists right it's not like people in 20 which is it, exactly what it's supposed to do it's democratizing it's permissionless it's yet another reason aside from censorship uh resistance that we like crypto right it's the whole point is to democratize financial services in ways that the centralized entities don't like that's not a yeah, like it's not it's not the snake eating its own tail to have borrowers and lenders doing their thing on ETH instead of through TradFi through like the the T bill ETF. You know, it's to me it's like it's very fundamental and kind of democratic. Yeah, I think that's look the way that I view this 
is that ETH is not going to generate any meaningful activity from the valuable thing that you have just described. That's the issue. And so one, one part is I agree that what you just described is extremely valuable yeah, and will be used in a substantial way. I disagree that it's going to take place on ETH. And the reason that I disagree it's going to take place on ETH is like coming from somebody that has interacted with institutions a lot. There's no actual reason that an institution would go with ETH over Solana because Solana also has a lot of institutional backers. You see, you see what I'm saying? No, no I disagree make, with that. I disagree with that. I, I, look, people make people because it's about the application. It's not about the settlement layer. And so, for example, if you want to launch a tokenization project, if you want to launch, let's say Donald Trump decides to do his real estate tokenization, it's very possible that he builds it on Solana. It's equally possible that he builds it on Solana as he does on that, that, he, that he does on ETH. I guarantee you, if we're in a world where real estate is getting put on chain, a substantial amount of assets are getting put on ETH. Like, I don't think it's a... Uh... I don't think it's like a random coincidence that BlackRock launched their tokenization fund on Ethereum and not Solana. Like they will probably, both of those chains will probably get a lot of action. I don't think it's going to be one or the other. Like Solana is faster. It's more performant. Frankly, it breaks more, right? ETH is older. It hasn't broken, uh, but it's slower, right? So each one has its benefits and its drawbacks. I think if you're looking for something that's, if you're like at a slower institution, you're, you know, trying not to get fired and you're looking to build on something with the longest history and the most stability, like you could choose ETH and not get fired for that decision. Meanwhile, if you're trying to build some like new application that requires a lot more um, entries in the ledger, uh, you probably would be safe putting that on Solana, especially as the blockchain matures. So I, I don't think it's like either or, I think they can both coexist. Yeah, I, I think the issue, the issue for me is that I disagree with that for one reason, and it's that there's really not that much differentiation in terms of risk, if you're going into crypto, you're that that that's the risk. In my per that's not 95% of the discussion in the first place. It's the, the, the fact that you're going into crypto, then there's 5% of discussion around, okay, like, how do we get into crypto? But I don't the, these people differentiate a little bit, I think between ETH and Blanda, but not as much as you think, at least for my discussions. Okay. I mean, it's, I trust it, you. The issue, the issue is, hey, do we do anything with crypto? And and so you're saying once they cross that chasm, they're just headed straight to Solana. They're not even going to bother with ETH. Or if they head to ETH, they're going to go to like partner with Coinbase or something, and it's going to go on base, and the fees won't accumulate to the mainnet. The other the other thing is that a lot of a lot of this will have to do with BD, and right now Solana is more centralized than ETH in terms of BD and nobody does BD for ETH. Vitalik, I L guess. L BD L free. L2s and do BD. But the reality of the situation, I say that a lot. <laughs> the, the fact of the, the matter is. The fact of the matter is. <laughs> what you have to understand about this. ETH has no business development, number one. Number two. Uh, yeah. Where am is, I? Is that... <laughs> anyway, long story short. The problem is that ETH doesn't have BD, L2s have BD, ETH doesn't, and that tech doesn't always win out. Let's try some. Let's try something different. Instead of arguing about the philosophical part of it, you think ETH BTC is up or down in a month? Probably down. Yeah. And why do you think it's down? Because the trend is your friend, and that's just the way that the flows are going right now. But between now and next year, ETH... ETH you know, ETH could be up a lot versus Solana. Solana is like near, near cycle highs. Um, and ETH just isn't. I think that soul ETH charts going one way and that one way is up and to the right. Huh. It certainly isn't going to the left, but I know, I know it's going up and to the right and ETH, unfortunately to me, unless it gets a, it, it could get a sailor. So if anyone's listening, if ETH got a sailor, that would be great. That would be a great thing because we could all just go along ETH BTC and make a ton of money. ETH needs Larry Fink to just come out and be like, I'm replacing my back office with this and I'm going to go on CNBC once a week to re-explain why, right? That would be that, would be that moment. So then with that, with that in mind, 
I wonder if you just stay short ETH BTC until you get a piece of news, because what what we're what we're saying here, if you really step back, is that there is no narrative, there is no reason for ETH to go up. It needs a catalyst, and the catalyst will probably be telegraphed in the sense that it will be an announcement or it will be it probably won't be anything other than an announcement that sends this thing back up and so on any bounces stay short and use that as a hedge for your book yeah that's probably the way to play it i mean when you do that in TradFi markets when you like collect some carry trade like oh this whole borrowing yen swapping into dollars and lending lending dollars thing it's just up and to the right. And then one day you're down like three years worth of money. I don't think it'll be that kind of a violent move in ETH uh, BTC or in Sol ETH. I think it's, you'll probably have your chance to flip before you get ruined if you're paying close attention to the charts. I, I agree with you, Avi. Yeah, maybe maybe Larry Fink will come in and save you. I mean, that's that's always my my thesis is, is I hope for richer men to save me. What a great thesis. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> until they're, until the SEC, like on a serious note, until yeah. the SEC allows capital to flow into our space in new ways, like, um, you know, allowing tokens to pass through dividends or allowing tokens to give you equity in projects, token, basically tokenized equity with a super clear uh, uh, regulatory framework. Until that happens, the only source of capital inflows is richer people buying your bags or armies of smaller people buying your bags. Um, yeah, I prefer the armies of smaller people because it's a lot easier to sell sell to them personally. Yeah. I noticed when I was getting out of Bowdoin that big pumps can occur on small volume and little little amounts of volume uh, when you try to like push it through the exit send the price down quite a lot. I, I did notice that. Yeah. I mean, you have to you have to be really careful tra trading those things. I mean, there's there's a specific there's a specific way to do it. Actually, I, I would just ran into this because I'm accumulating a small cap, which I can't talk about, but because don't want to get in trouble. But I think that the best way to accumulate these things are to put in small, basically put in these small market orders that just spike the price and that always attracts sellers. And then people will come and sell into that and then you can just do it again. Because what people look for to sell is they look for, you know, they, they, they look for weird price action. So for example, if you have a one candle that's 10% in a small cap, people will often take profits into that versus if you TWAP into the token over time and it goes up like 1% an hour, then people are actually a lot more likely to buy it. And so it's actually counterintuitive, but I think it's, I think it's better to market buy than to TWAP in. Tax. I don't. I don't think that's kosher in TradFi. Like I hear my compliance officer from Goldman Sachs, like over my left shoulder, like I wouldn't do that if I were you, Jonah. <laughs> that's basically um, called painting the tape. No, I don't think so. But I mean, because we're not like, I'm. I'm not like you know. If I if I have a TWAP, and I, I said, guess it's your, do, your, you have do, a rationale do, do like, for the trade, right? Like, do like do like one do like one market order, an hour. Why is that? Why is that bad to do one? Yeah, I guess you, you're now? genuinely trying to buy. It's there's like I'm, I'm trying to buy the whole thing. It's just like instead you're not of doing just a like bunch of, you're allowed. You're allowed to pick how to execute. I'm allowed to ch ch do one large order every hour instead of one order every five seconds. Yeah, it's true. No, it's, you're absolutely right to do so. Um, I didn't. I guess that if you're trying to just get more liquidity by executing a different mm -hmm. type of order, it seems totally legit. Obviously, none of this is compliance advice or trading advice. Again, we we clearly don't know what we're talking about, but it, it is it is kind of an interesting concept. Like, how do you get the most liquidity? How do you attract people's attention? How do you sell it? <clears throat> Are a lot of these tokens? How's the OTC market, Avi? Since I left it, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, how has it evolved? Is it super deep and liquid for random low low market cap coins, or have things gotten worse since then? I have absolutely no idea to be completely honest with you, because I don't trade OTC anymore. Um, <clears throat> I just go, you know, we just trade direct, direct on exchange. Having run an OTC desk, I would not, I would not trade OTC. <laughs> like it, it's, it, I don't understand why people do it, frankly. I mean, look there, if you're going to be trading in this asset class, the, especially if you're short-term trading, so it doesn't really matter if you're gunning for two X's 
because your execution costs are, you know, if your if execution costs are three percent, five percent each way, and you're going for a two x, three x, four x, who cares? But the issue is that a lot of people are gunning for twenty percent, and then they don't take into account execution costs, and they don't take into account smart accumulation or smart selling. And then what they end up doing is if you're gunning for 20% and you're 3% in one way and 3% out the other, you're really hurting your risk reward. So you have to be very careful, which is why whenever I trade this asset class, especially on choppy days like today, the goal is always to, it's a Costanza rule. When things are down, that's when you buy. And when things are up, that's when, that's when you sell. And I definitely think that anyone that's click trading, if you're, if you're click trading more than like, if you're doing more than a million dollars in volume, which is actually pretty easy. I, I know a lot of people with like a hundred thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars that somehow hit a million dollars in volume. Um, if you're, if you're doing, if you're doing that much volume a month or even, you know, every six months, it, it's worthwhile invest, you know, paying $5,000 for a good execution tool, whether that's in, you know, whether that's in silico, I, I don't use them or coin routes or something well, else. Lily, 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 Lily here says limit buy, not market buy. And I kind of agree with Lily. Like, I think that unless you're in a hurry and you're FOMOing into something, it doesn't hurt to just stick a bit in there and wait for it to, to get filled. The in, from information is too transparent in crypto. If you have a limit buy and you put in a limit buy and it's visible, whether that's an on-chain limit buy or uh, exchange limit buy, I think that that's just, I, I don't like limit buys. What I like to do is I like to uh, sweep at a certain level, which is why I think execution tools are great. Because what you don't want to do is you never want to broadcast that information out there. No, that's fair. That's fair. Especially in really thin markets where some of these low FTV coins or sorry, low market cap coins, low float. Um, it's really like if you're getting in there trying to buy for a prop trade, it's often just you, right? Without you, the only thing you're seeing on screen is like market maker on market maker violence. And if you're getting in the middle of that, like those market makers are going to notice you immediately and kind of get, make the price uh, do things that are not what you want it to do. Which is why you have to be careful. And especially, I mean, so this week in TradFi has been the lowest, I mean, basically the lowest liquidity week in all, all year. Which Dog is days of summer. Which is to be expected. I think Bitcoin is trading like an illiquid shitcoin right now, which is one reason why you probably just need to walk away, you know, like establish your positions and walk away. There, there are a lot of good catalysts coming up that I personally, I personally really like. I mean, you have some conferences like Soul, Soul Breakpoint coming up. Uh, you have Stacks releasing their Nakamoto upgrade. You, you have Aptos running on the Korea blockchain week. Remember Aptos and the Koreans? They, one APT equals one apartment. That mean <laughs> there, no, there, there's some, I, there's I, some I, good Aptos. I, with all due respect to the the cool guy with the long hair, like why? Why? What's the point? Somebody explain to me why. Aptos, like what problem? most, mo the, most, the point of these things is to trade them and make money and then watch them go to zero after three years or not like Cardano and, and polka dot, but yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Actually, what is the market cap of Cardano? I haven't, th I haven't thought about that coin in a while. Let's see. Yeah. Enlighten me. That's crazy. It's still, it's still top 15, 13 billion. Thirteen billion dollars. Yeah. That's good. Three hundred million traded a day. See, that's the thing. The point of these assets is to trade them. There's there's a few select group of assets that are actually going to do things in the future and be useful, but the majority of these things are just for trading. Avi, we have two thousand people watching this live stream. There's no way we have two thousand people watching this. Thing. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, I can see why do so eyeballs. many people pay. There's literally no reason. I, I, you know what I think it is. I think you and I have both worked in pretty professional trading floor environments where we have a conversation like you hear in these trading floor environments. And 
I find it refreshing to hear other traders talk on a trading floor. I don't think there is any of that for crypto. Wait, are we just, are we live right now? Or are we just? Oh, I thought I didn't. I didn't yeah, we're live. we're live. We're live. Okay. Like no, I, I was I, okay. I, I oh think no, no, just, yeah. This, this 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 podcast is great. Everyone should watch. I, I'm I'm kind of shocked <laughs> that, that um, yeah, it's authentic. That's for sure. We clearly don't know what we're talking about. But yeah, it's, I think it's interesting that that there's no real place to hear trading floor talk in crypto. It just doesn't exist because there's no crypto trading floor. It's just a bunch of people holed up in their basements around the world, or um, super fancy offices, uh, clicking and trading, and it's kind of a solo. Um, game and you don't want to be in your own head too much. So it's important to it's important to talk. That's a that's something we should all do a little more of is get out there with the community and try and chat. Another shameless plug for our Telegram chat room. Jonah, do you own any soul uh, altcoins right now? The answer is no. I'm flat memes, completely flat memes. Let's take some more questions. Why 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 be flat memes? Here's why I would be flat memes. The reason to be flat memes right now is because there's no catalyst. There's literally no reason to be long a meme coin as the space consolidates and you have more and more supply getting printed on pump.fun every single day. Um, I think that's going to distract from Whiff and Bowdoin and all of the other exciting, well, Bowdoin's dead, Whiff and Mog and all of the other ones that are still alive. That's why I think that there's no real meme trade right now. I think that memes are going to be the last thing to rally after a big Bitcoin pump uh, or a big Solana pump. But I, I think it's too soon for that. I think you're safer in the majors. I think we need to just weather this this uh, next sort of fall period of chop. Let's see what other interesting um, what other interesting comments are in here. So this guy Robin debate says, bruh, you have 300 viewers. Don't be pretentious. Uh, bruh, we have 2000 viewers right now. 300 of them are on YouTube and 1700 are on X. So you can see this stream in multiple locations. Um, that's, that's why it's like that. It's over for helium. If Avi's truly on helium in Puerto Rico right now, which I think there's like a 60% chance of, <clears throat> then yes, it's this is definitively the the beginning of the end for helium. This Okay. Don't don't even don't even start. <laughs> Welcome back. I've been I've been monologuing here with the the chat room. What the fuck are you monologuing about? I was we were monologuing about how Puerto Rico is uh not necessarily up to snuff in terms of Wi-Fi infrastructure. Uh, how you were shilling helium while your your helium Wi-Fi broke down? I've got a I've got a few rebuttals to the peanut gallery. One, I'm on Verizon. If I was on helium, this wouldn't have happened. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, two, I don't live in Puerto Rico. What is my daily trading routine? Now, this is this is this, this is, is a good question. This is, this is a very good question. So, the most important thing in trading to me personally is the ability to reflect on my day, right? Because I need to know when you're trading, you make a ton of decisions every single day. And if you don't have a process or system to understand what decisions you're good at making and what decisions you're bad at making, you never get anywhere. You just end up, you just end up making the same mistakes over and over and over and over. So I always write down literally every decision that I made that day and why I made it and then review them at least once a week so that when I go back, uh, I can say to myself, okay, I'm good at this. I'm good at that. I'm bad at this. I'm bad at that. Right. So th th this, this is very important. And by the way, I just found out that Bloomberg has a notes app, which is great. So I just take all my notes. Finish the thought. Tell us about your daily trading routine. Come on. Stay yeah, focused. So, here. <laughs> so uh, the other, the other thing that I think is really important is a trading journal with your trades, right? So the P and L of your trades, and then making sure that you can actually tag them and say, okay, well, this is a long short trade. This is, you know, Rel Valley, you know, a long ETH, a long ETH BTC, or I call it a blotter. That, that's what us old guys used to call it. Yeah, like a, like a trade blotter with reasonable tags, so that you can go back and say, hey, I'm really good at trading events, or I'm really good at trading product launches, or I'm really good at trading unlocks and flows, or I'm really bad at that, right? And the other 
the other thing that's Im important is making sure that you end up with a system in place. So once you figure out what you're good at, you stay away from doing the things that you know that you're bad at. And I know that that sounds really simple and really straightforward, but you cannot imagine the amount of people that I've seen that know that they're bad at something and can't help themselves because they think that they can do it. They're like, ah, oh, like I can, I, I, you know, I, I know I've messed up in the, in the past for the last year doing this thing, but I, this time, this time it'll be different. Training um, does put you into that weird mind warp where sometimes you think that like you think that you're making money on something where you're actually losing money on it. Like there's, there's so much weird psychology. I, I saw this a lot when I was in um, sell side trading, like you'd have people out on a trading floor making markets uh, or in the case of physical commodities, like buying and selling assets or assets filled with commodities. And they thought that they were doing great prop trading, um, like, but they weren't, right? They were actually losing a little bit of money prop trading and making a lot of money on the business that they were operating. <clears throat> and there's this weird like mind meld psychology thing where almost down to the last person, all of those people thought that they were fantastic prop traders. And then a lot of them went on to go try to trade prop at hedge funds and failed. If you're, if you're just trading your own book, um, you don't, you know, or if you're trading at a hedge fund, like you don't really have as much ability to get caught in that bias because you're, there's no asset to hide behind. There's no market making. There's no business that you can basically misattribute PL from to your own genius. However, there is one thing that you can do when you're sitting by yourself um, in a room trading that really f messes with a lot of people's minds that I've seen. And this goes straight to your point, Avi. I've seen a lot of people trade like crazy, churn in and out of stuff, make a little bit of money on it, in the middle of cycles where Bitcoin, like the price of Bitcoin will double they'll make like 10% and they'll think they're doing a great job, right? And then after tax, they're left with like even less than what they thought they made. And they're like forced selling things to pay their tax bill. And so basically the importance of a process is to know not just how much money you're making, but whether you're outperforming uh, just hodling Bitcoin and doing absolutely nothing. That's really important uh, to, to monitor in terms of process. Otherwise, you may actually be losing money versus what you would have earned if you just stuck your money in Bitcoin and, and walked away and, and spent your precious time earning m more money in another way to invest in Bitcoin. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I 100% I, I agree with that. There, there's a lot of interesting comments in this chat that we could talk about. Is there anything in particular you want to discuss right now, Avi? This is, I mean, both of us are a little off, off balance because this is the first time we've done this format, but it's friggin' awesome. Yeah, I mean... This is this is great. Why don't we do one? Why don't we do one again? This, we can even do one on Thursday. Yeah, I'm down. We'll maybe we'll invite another guest. But I gotta, I gotta, I gotta hop. Unfortunately. Okay. Well, it was a good time talking to you, Avi. Thanks for uh, thanks for making time as always. I loved it. No, nah, this, this is great. And keep the keep the comments coming. We love all of you. We love, we love you guys. Uh, none of this is financial advi advice. Apologies in advance to our producers who are going to have to hack this together into something that seems halfway professional for the recorded episode. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll work on it. I'm going to, I'm going to find better Wi-Fi for next time. Use that helium, sign up for helium and tell us how it goes. Yeah. Bring on high. Yeah, definitely. High stakes capital. Yeah. That, that, that's a great idea. I'll definitely bring on high stakes capital for sure. No, I don't have here. Okay. Yeah. We'll try to get a guest for the next one. <laughs> All righty, Avi. See you later.